Let's talk about Hinduism, and we're going to introduce this topic on our way to animism or spiritism, and I'll explain later how these two are connected. Hinduism is a massive religion. It's probably the third largest religion in the world after Christianity and Islam. It has probably around a billion adherents. But there are some details that you should know and you should recognize about Hinduism as we discuss it here. First of all, you should know that Hinduism is essentially limited to India. Of course, you have people that leave India and travel abroad and so spread around the world in that sense. But Hinduism is arguably and essentially the national religion of India. And the overwhelming majority, nearly all of the adherents, are either in India or connected to India, the Indian diaspora. Um, Hinduism has been spread around the world in various ways that we can see, and you can find this in, in various international uh, expressions. So, for instance, uh, Mahatma Gandhi is an extremely famous and extremely respected figure worldwide. He fought first apartheid in South Africa and then later and more significantly he fought some of the uh, issues of the caste system and some of the problems of poverty within India. And for that he won or received the, the plaudits, the approval and the respect of people worldwide. And he very much represented um, the, or very much presented Hinduism as a part of his philosophy. You also hear just as a cultural meme or just a, a concept that's tossed around the concept of karma. It's really stripped of its original idea, but people will talk about in all kinds of contexts worldwide, sort of an idea that if you do something evil or mean to someone in one context, then maybe that's going to come back on you. If you're kind to someone or you do good somehow, then that's going to come back to you as well. And so people on a popular level use that concept or that word as a way of expressing things coming back on them. Very popular form of exercise, yoga, is, was originally connected to Hinduism. And that's used as exercise um, mostly across the world, but actually it had deeper roots, not just exercise, but also an entire philosophy. Um, and even to the extent of kind of being a, a philosophy and a religion. And then various Western cultural concerns, uh, feminism, environmentalism, a general emphasis on toleration. Some of those ideas have been expressed and advocated in the name of Hinduism, so that across the West, actually, it's quite popular to talk about Hinduism. So I don't know that people really are prepared to completely accept and, and live out the philosophy of Hinduism. Here's a quotation that I think represents some of this, this uh, concern or this way of thinking about Hinduism. This is a famous advocate of Hinduism and, and actually brought a lot of Hinduism into the West. And he just said, I am proud to belong to a re religion which has taught the world tolerance and universal acceptance. We believe not only in universal toleration, but we accept all religions as true. And I think that brings us into a, 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 an introduction on Hinduism, kind of the philosophy or the thoughts, or the ideas behind Hinduism and what is represented here. Hinduism advocates many gods. Actually, there's no way to count the number of gods. Some estimates well above a million. And that's because actually the concept of God or a God is a, a completely flexible, almost liquid sort of thing. Um, in fact, specifically, some of the gods are appearing in multiple different forms. And so they, they might have different appearances across time. Every individual temple can have its own god. Every individual household can have its own god. And in a sense, then, it is polytheism in the sense of many, many, many gods 
In another sense, the idea underneath it or the assumption underneath it is that all of these gods are just various expressions of the single reality. All of them are in some way Brahman, which is the, the universal reality. And so all of these gods are just kind of different forms or expressions of the one. And yet, in any case, you end up with many, many, and too many to count, millions of gods. Here are some of the more famous um, expressions or personalities of divinity or of de deity. And so you can see kind of the original supreme sky god, but eventually in the story he loses that supremacy. Kind of a concept of Mother Earth, a later sky god, um, though across time he loses popularity. A king of the gods, a sun god, a god of truth, um, various minor gods, mountain gods, fire gods, gods of drink and uh, immortality. And um, even here, sometimes you'll hear, if, if you look um, online, you'll find different chants that are being spoken. And there's a certain sound, kind of a sound that is a sacred sound. Um, so that words and saying the words correctly end up being an expression of worship or an expression of divinity. There are some really intricate, mind-blowing songs that are sung, kind of chants, and the words themselves are part of the rhythm. And the whole experience, the, what it creates inside of you, is all part of the worship and actually like an ex expression of something divine happening, something itself inherently sacred, and all of reality is brought around into this. What this would look like on just a normal, um, just a typical worship or typical expression of Hinduism, how would people do this? Well, there is no clear way of salvation in Hinduism, but there are various rites that are carried out, various things that people will do in taking care of their local god. So at an individual temple, then you're going to have some kind of, some kind of uh, physical manifestation of the god, an idol. And in the morning, you'll wake it from sleep, you'll feed it, you'll clothe it, maybe bathe it. Uh, take care of it the way that you would take care of a person or a child. And that taking care of that god is an expression somehow of, of worship. Other rituals that people will follow would be praise, chant, burning incense, various kinds of prayers. And so all of these at these local temples are ways of honoring or worshiping this God, but also an idea of bringing success or good fortune to your own life. And that causes me to highlight then the way of salvation or what is the point within Hinduism. There is no clear way of salvation in the sense that you and I might think of it. it the, the notion that I am a sinner and I need to be saved from my sin or forgiven of my sin, that's a rather, rather a Christian notion. But the idea instead would go, a, a major purpose, a core purpose of Hinduism is to bring about good fortune. In other words, you go and you, you go through some of these rites maybe because you're about to apply for a new job. And so before you apply to a new job, then you're going to go to one of the gods that kind of fits that need, and you're going to offer some incense, and maybe you might even pay for an extra ritual to be carried out, and the priest might do something on your behalf. All of that with the goal that this god will bring good fortune on your upcoming job. You're struggling with depression. So you go to a, a god who kind of specializes in that area, or a, a god of good fortune, of good feelings, uh, of enjoyment. And so you go to that god and you might spend some time there and that's going to help address this need. It, it's kind of that you would go to the individual god that fits the need that you are seeking to address. Another concept that might be close to our notion of or closer to our notion of salvation. Hindu, Hinduism has built into it the concept of reincarnation. And it shares, I'll return to this, shares much in Buddha, with Buddhism in this sense. The concept of reincarnation goes, all of us are on a constant cycle where we die and we come back again in another form. That cycle then has the, the structure of 
a circle. You're going around and around and around, basically going around endlessly. This means then that I'm born, I live my life, I come around, I die. But that's not the end of the story. Because after then I die, I come back again, and I go through this cycle again, and I go through this cycle again, and I go through this cycle again. There's a very interesting dynamic to this, or the thoughts that are behind this, because I think all of us are tormented or would be horrified by an idea that when we die, we're just gone, that there is no continuing reality. And so there's a notion of after death, what next? There must be something more. But there is something actually horrifying as well in the idea that you continue to go and continue to go and continue to go around. Something I would say kind of exhausting in all of it. And part of then the concept of Hinduism is that all of this endless going around is an exhausting kind of torment. And it's a kind of torment that you have to escape. One of the strong ideas in Hinduism, which is common and shared as well with Buddhism, is that this existence of ours is filled with suffering and struggle and weariness, and we need to escape it. And so this endless cycling around and around and around, we seek to escape eventually by just becoming not nothing, or actually being absorbed into everything, becoming part again of everything. Now, I, I've said several times here that Hinduism shares much with Buddhism, and we will discuss further Buddhism later on, and I'll give some of the same answers there that we're talking about here. But for now, I do want to highlight that there is a difference between the two approaches, and it's an important one. So both approaches or both views have a, a concept here of the going around and around and around and this endless cycle that is... Um, just a torment, an exhaustion. Both views also have, generally, uh, a kind of an idea of progress at the same time. So what I mean by this is, even though there is a sense of circling around endlessly, there is also a sense that you can kind of, depending on your actions, you can progress somewhere. You can progress in a general direction going, what I would say maybe up, or you could actually, by your actions, progress in a general direction going down, a negative direction. And the reason for this is you don't necessarily come back in the same form that you lived previously. In other words, the assumption would be, okay, I, I, was, I happened to be born as a male, um, but, you know, in my previous life, maybe I was something else. Maybe in a previous life, I was... Um, a person who was more, you know, who was wealthy and powerful and in position of status. But because of acting wickedly in my previous life, I've been downgraded. And now, therefore, I'm not a person of status, I'm just a normal person. Or maybe it went the other way. And maybe in my previous life, I was something lower. And now I've been upgraded because in my previous life, I did it particularly well. And in that idea, then, you look around you, not just at the people, but even at the creatures, even at the animals. And in all of them, you see the same kind of life reality, soul, being, and it's spread out through all the creatures. In other words, a cockroach might be upgraded later to something better. A cockroach might be upgraded to a cat. A cat might be upgraded later to a cow. A cow might be later upgraded to a female, human. And a female, she lives well, might be upgraded to a man. And a man, if he lives poorly, might be downgraded to a woman. And this kind of cycle in the reincarnation is also part of the cyclical process. That you do what you're supposed to do, and if you do it correctly, then you can be upgraded and raised to a higher level or downgraded and raised to a lower level. Now, here's one of the distinctions, though, between Hinduism and Buddhism, and it's an important one. Hinduism divides up humanity into different categories. 
And the different categories within Hinduism then become part of this status or become part of your category as a, an individual, as a being. And then if we're talking about that notion then, there are four categories within with Hinduism, what's called the caste system. The caste system in Hinduism includes top level Brahmins, the priestly caste. The second level ruling warrior type, so rulers or warriors. A third category, merchants and farmers. And a fourth category, the laborers and the servants. And each one of those categories has a, a relative value or a relative worth. If you're born into that system or you're born into that caste, that is who you are. And it can't be changed. You're not supposed to marry outside of your caste. In many cases, you're not really even supposed to interact that much outside of your caste. You stay within your group. That's who you are. And that's locked in. There is actually a fifth category, and that is because they are not even part of the caste system. They're outside of it entirely. These are the outcasts or the untouchables, the Dalits. And once you're born into that class, it's fixed because the idea goes, if you don't like your caste, or if you would ask for something more, you want to be part of a, a different group than you are, you, you don't want to be an untouchable. Well, then the answer is you just have to live your life, this life, well, so that in the next time around, maybe you would be raised to a higher level of existence. And the concept of reincarnation then is deeply tied in with this concept of the castes or the fixed order of who you are as a person. Now, that allows me to make a point here that I would like to highlight. Where, especially in Western contexts, people appropriate Hinduism as an expression of universal toleration. Well, Hinduism accepts all religions, so this is the way forward and this is a better way because it's so tolerant, it accepts anything and it can just accumulate or it, it, can, it can just um, just assimilate any other religion. Actually, I would argue that Hinduism turns out not to be a terribly tolerant faith after all. It, and I will start with just what I, was, what I was just saying. In terms of the castes, is this really a notion that is so tolerant? To say that certain people, not based on their actions even within the present life, certain people are fixed in their status. That's who they are and that's all that they can do. Is that really uh, an, expression, an expression of progressive tolerance? that we have these categories of people that are fixed like that. I, I would go further to say, if you look at recent and contemporary events in regards to Hinduism, you can look at a little bit of Indian politics and the current ruling party has hardened very much the categories of Hinduism. Actually, the, the ruling party is directly associated, even in their title, with Hinduism. And they've worked very hard to push away some of the other religions that are within India. The greatest category after Hinduism, the largest category is Islam. And then of course there are Christians as well. And those people have been very much persecuted during this era by the Hindu Nationalist Party. The government of India is pushing hard to say that Hinduism is our national religion and if you don't subscribe to Hinduism, you're not really part of our system, or at least you're going to be at a significant disadvantage. And I would argue then that the attempt to kind of propose a sort of universal tolerance, well, we accept all religions, ends up collapsing. And you end up with a very intolerant kind of framework. A few other things you should know about Hinduism the, um, the texts of Hinduism, particularly uh, the Vedas and the Upanishads are major texts within Hinduism that are revered. And the most significant text of all of those is a 700 word poem within Hinduism that talks through some of these, these concepts of seeking rest or seeking um, 
rightness and freedom, liberation from all of this struggle and sorrow, called the Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita. And a very famous, even used in the West or referred to in the West as a document that's to be revered. A second, you should know that because of some of the concepts of reincarnation, the various spirits, the various deities, that Hinduism reveres and is very careful not to harm any animals, especially cows. Cows are a very sacred animal in particular. And you will see some of the effects of this. If you, you, can, you can see examples of people within India, and if animals come in and destroy their crops or cause problems, it's, you, you can't harm these animals. You can't do anything to push back, even if it's causing significant damage. You will have trouble if, if you go into India and you want to buy beef. You're, you're not going to find it. Um, you're going to find very much resistance to even lots of different expressions of eating meat, but in particular with cows because of their sacredness. And the last thing I want to mention about Hinduism leads us into our next discussion, which is I'm going to argue Hinduism, we, we might think of it as uh, a tolerant religion, so kind of connected to Buddhism because it, it just accepts all of the other religions. As I've just argued, it's an intolerant kind of tolerance, but kind of a pantheistic religion trying to incorporate every faith into itself and unsuccessfully so. But I also would argue even while Hinduism has similarities to Buddhism, its greatest similarity is in the other direction to animism. And what I mean by that is animism, or spiritism, sometimes it's called, is a worship of all of the different deities associated with all kinds of phenomena of nature. So you worship a sun god, you worship a river god, you worship the mountain god, you worship the god of the fire. And you end up with all of these different kinds of spirits that are connected in with the different parts of the world around you. I would argue then that if we take spiritism or animism, we just go through and we kind of um, systematize a little bit, organize a little bit, create some rituals and universalize it and spread it into kind of more of a package religion. So we take the general concepts of animism and we exalt them a little bit. You have Hinduism. I think Hinduism is a refined or a heightened expression of animism and spiritism. And as such then, our analysis of Hinduism will follow some of the exact same analysis that we will use either for Buddhism, and we'll have some of the discussion there, or on the other hand, talking about spiritism or animism. How then would you address or interact with Hinduism? Or how would you work out your apologetics if you were having a conversation with someone? A, a few pieces of advice. Um, first, be careful, it's complicated. If you start to ridicule or you start to attack Hinduism, you're going to give the impression that you're attacking someone's cultural heritage. And that's because Hinduism, across its history, as probably one of the oldest religions, is deeply connected in with India and Indian culture such that you're attacking Hinduism sounds like you're attacking an entire culture or an entire group of people and their way of life. And so as you deal with them, I, I would not ridicule, but I would, as we've done with other discussions, I would ask questions. Some of the questions that you can ask or some of the things that you can kind of explore and emphases that you should make. With all of the myriad gods, the millions of gods, what is the source and what is the foundation behind all of that? And what we're pointing to is there is a God above all the gods. There is a creator of the universe. There is a true God, the one God. Now, the reason I'm going to start with that emphasis, a real problem with Hinduism or with apologetics to Hinduism, 
is that as you then present the Christian God, people's temptation is just to incorporate him into the rest of their system. Oh, okay, so great, another God. So I already have a lot, and here's one more, and maybe he has some powers that can help me, and oh, you tell me he's a particularly powerful God. <laughs> Even better. I love powerful gods. The more powerful, the better. And the concern then with a framework in Hinduism that, that purports to be so tolerant and willing to assimilate any other faith is that you have not brought in the exclusivity that Christianity claims and, and demands that there is one God, the true God, the only God. And so some concepts here that you would want to present and need to emphasize here, very similar here to Buddhism, emphasize God as creator. God, the creator of heaven and earth. Within the framework of Hinduism, reality is just sort of there. And the various spirits around reality are, are all together forming reality. But the notion of a personal God who existed before reality and who created reality and who is in charge of all reality is a very critical and very different notion than the framework of Hinduism. A second concept similar to that is the notion of having relationship with God. And I think what you can see from our discussion, what we've already said here, Hinduism puts forth the various gods as kind of means or tools. These are, these are various methods that can be used to get what you want or to get to where you need. So get, get to the place that you need to be. So, okay, I'm going to get married. I need to go to a God who's going to give me good fortune in my marriage. I'm going to pursue this job. Let me go to a God who's good at giving me success in that area. And as such, then you're kind of using spiritual power. You're going and doing something in order to get what you want. It's essentially your goal to be in control of the world around you. And Christianity is entirely different in that Christianity tells us we go to God, a personal God, a personal God with whom we have a relationship. And not just in order for us to control him to get what we want, but to relate to him and to love him and him loving us in anticipation of eternity with him. And finally, a concept that you're going to want to emphasize that's just in total distinction is that our ultimate salvation is not escaping only from suffering and certainly not from escape, escaping from continued existence. Our hope is not just that we will cease to exist, but our hope and our salvation is that we will exist forever in relationship with this creator God who made us and who has redeemed us. All of those kinds of questions, of course, are going to take you to the question of how it's possible for this to be, salvation, the cross, the historical person, Jesus Christ. If you talk about, or as you, when you talk about Jesus Christ, it's going to be important for you to emphasize that he is not just one more, um, one of many appearances of God, because part of the concept within Hinduism is that God can appear in these different forms, and so seven or nine or millions of different appearances of this God. It's going to be important to emphasize that Jesus Christ comes not just as a form, one more evidence or one more manifestation, an avatar of God, but that Jesus himself is fully God and that he comes as the single expression, the single incarnation of deity. As you talk, you're going to also find people giving you a, very much a concept of agreeing with everything you say. And so whatever you propose, they're going to say, oh, that's great, that's helpful. Yes, I'd love to incorporate that into my faith as well. And so you're going to have to talk about the concept of exclusivity. You're going to have to talk about concepts like Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, the life, and that alone 
No one comes to the Father but by me. Extremely exclusive. And I think you're going to find in that moment that the, the Christian claim that all other faiths are wrong, Jesus alone is the only way. There is salvation found in no other. There is no name written under heaven whereby we must be saved other than his. You're going to find in that then that suddenly Hinduism is not going to be tolerant. As soon as you give these intolerant statements of Jesus, then Hinduism has to reject that. And in that, then you're able to lead them directly to the true Savior, the one God who redeems us from our sin. We will continue this concept in spiritism or animism, but I want to encourage you and challenge you here. The richness of our having a relationship with the one true God and the richness of the blessing that we do not just go to God in order to get what we want. It's not that we are at the center of the universe and we need to find a way that God can help us get to what we want, as though God is a tool or a means. But it is, it is that he is at the center of the universe. And we come to him in worship and find in him true meaning and true joy. And I trust that you have the the blessing and privilege of that relationship. I trust that you are able to share that joyfully and truly with other people, calling both Hindus and non-Hindus to have a relationship with the one God who made us, who redeems us, and with whom we will spend all eternity in the glorious salvation that he has provided.